Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sanjeev Sam Gambier Early Professionals Forum, which has been organized to honor our wonderful Sam and his unwavering dedication to men mentorship of future generations and imaging scientists. This particular forum is focused on cancer metabolism. And you'll be hearing from two fantastic speakers, Dr. Tim Whitney and Dr. Hannah Greenwood shortly. As most of you know, Tim was a world-renowned, I mean, Sam, <laughs> Tim as well, but Sam was a world-renowned clinician scientist and a visionary who was a leader and a pioneer in many fields, including molecular imaging, early detection of cancer and precision health. Sam was the Virginia and DK Ludwig Professor of Cancer Research and the Chair of Radiology at Stanford University. He directed the Molecular Imaging Program at Stanford, MIPS, the Canary Center at Stanford for Cancer Early Detection, and the Precision Health and Integrated Diagnostic Center at Stanford. Yes, he really did hold all of those roles and he did a phenomenal job. He was a superhuman. He was also credited as the founding father of molecular imaging. Sam really led by example. He created an inspiring and safe environment where people could have fun together, both inside and outside of work. He was an exceptional mentor. He was genuinely interested in each of his mentees' lives. He would often ask about his trainees' families, their hobbies. He would check in to see how, they, how each of his students were doing. And if they weren't doing okay, he would do everything in his power to help them. Sam advised more than 150 postdoctoral scholars and graduate students throughout his career and inspired countless others. Many have gone on to become leaders in their own disciplines, which is so fantastic to see. Uh, although he was taken from us too soon, we're incredibly thankful to have known him for the time that we did. And we, including people that you'll see on this webinar today and all the countless folk that he inspired, will do everything in our power to ensure his legacy, his mentorship style and the work he cared so much about is carried forward. Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Tim Whitney. Tim and I actually overlapped in Sam's lab and we had a lot of fun working together. So it really is a pleasure to be able to introduce Tim today. He is a Wellcome Trust Senior Research Fellow and Reader in Molecular Imaging at King's College London School of Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Sciences. Tim obtained his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge in 2010, where he worked in the laboratory of Professor Kevin Brendel. In 2010, Tim started his postdoc in Imperial, where he focused on developing novel pet traces for cancer imaging, before moving to Stanford University in 2013 to work under Professor Sam Gambier, which we're really happy he did. Uh, he did further postdoctoral training there, and in 2015, he moved to the University of College London Centre for Advanced Biomedical Imaging, where he set up his awesome research group under a UCL Excellence Fellowship and Wellcome Trust Royal Society Sir Henry Dale Fellowship. In 2018, he moved to King's College London to take up his current post. So without further ado, I would like to pass it over to Dr. Tim Whitney. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that, that wonderful introduction and, and for those, um, those great words about Sam. Um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about Sam and what he was like and what an inspiration he was to me as part of my, um, uh, my presentation. But I should probably start by saying I could have had no better introduction to Stanford life than having you as what was deemed as our big buddy. So Sam always had uh, a way of making sure that people new to his lab were well integrated um, by by uh, assigning them a more senior member of, of the lab and you were my big buddy and I couldn't have asked for a better one. Um, so with that, it's uh, it's a real pleasure to sort of to kick off this, um, this seminar series and it's a real honor to be presenting work in Sam's name. He, he was a real inspiration, as Michelle said, to, to many of us, to every one of us, I would say, that had the fortune of passing through his lab. And it wasn't just his scientific excellence. I mean, you know, being in his presence and hearing the way that he, he thought, you know, it, it just took you to another level. But, um, it, you know, this has been really well documented. But I think as somebody who went through his lab, something that hasn't been said so widely to, to the community is actually his, his great sense of fun and and community spirit. Um, you know, th there's countless times when we were in lab meetings where we would just come in with a, a sly grin on his face and he would say, everybody, I guess you've heard of, uh, you know, the fingerprints, right? This is really important. And then he'd look at you with a bit of a wry smile and he'd go, yes, but have you heard of the bum print? And you know, the, all, all of these little things, way of describing them, um, but, but look, uh, maybe we leave that to the discussions afterwards. Today I'm going to talk about one of the areas that actually Sam 
really was a strong advocate for uh, and did a lot of very strong work, but probably is not seen to be as one of his primary focuses, and that's uh, cancer metabolism. Now, metabolism itself uh, describes the series of linked chemical reactions that are required to sustain life itself, either through the creation of ATP or uh, building blocks uh, for large macromolecule synthesis. Um, and what we see here is like a standard textbook depiction of metabolism. And hopefully what you can all see here is that uh, the, these uh, pathways are interlinked in, in, in one way or another. They're not uh, actually separate. Um, in terms of um, uh, these different pathways. But the reality is that you know, metabolism is, is far more complex than what is depicted in textbooks. This is a far more natural depiction of cancer. Um, and so I guess during malignant transformation, it's no surprise that uh, somewhere along these pathways, something goes awry. Um, and that really um, is known to be, be the case. And this sort of started off with some of the pioneering experiments in the early 20th century by this guy, Otto Warburg, who made the surprising discovery at the time that uh, tumour cells secrete far more lactic acid uh, than their normal uh, healthy counterparts. Um, and so began this kind of field of cancer metabolism. And at the time, the hypothesis was that these tumour cells uh, selectively upregulate glycolytic flux um, and downregulate um, normal oxidative phosphorylation, which in some ways is, is quite surprising given the fact that oxidative phosphorylation provides far more ATP than glycolysis itself. But actually following in the stead of, of Otto Warburg, there's been many other cancer metabolism pioneers. We're lucky enough that, that Ralph will be joining us for WMIC uh, this year as one of our plenary speakers, so we'll hear a bit more of that. But these later pioneers have really shown that it's, it's not a switch between glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation. In fact, in these tumour cells, metabolism is upregulated um, across the board. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a wiring up. And I guess this is to, uh, to try and um, effectively support this increased cellular proliferation. And of course, in BUILD, we've exploited the fact that uh, tumour cells upregulate metabolic pathways for imaging with, with FDG, uh, the movement of glucose across the glute transporters and its phosphorylation by hexakinase to give us this exquisite signal that we see uh, in most tumours. Um, and of course, uh, FDG uh, has been used for many uh, decades for staging and restaging of cancer. Um, and really, without FDG, we wouldn't have nuclear medicine as we know it. Um, but SAM played a really important role, and maybe it's a role that not many people uh, know about uh, getting FDG accepted into the clinic. So he, he published many um, seminal papers um, describing the quantification um, of, of FDG and its reproducibility, but probably his one of his biggest uh, sort of uh, additions to this body of literature was this decision tree uh, series of studies that he performed in for clinical FDG PET. Um, and you know th this is a, a, in some ways a relatively complicated method, but this was uh, comparing FDG PET um, itself as shown here in terms of the decision the clinician will have to make versus the CT alone, showing that there are far more options available to the clinician if they had sub um, subsequent PET to, um, to go with the CT. And really from this, he could do some uh, relatively sort of insightful calculations in terms of the amount of value that the FDG PET scan would provide um, in terms of dollars and its relation first to, to sensitivity and then also to specificity. And really this was one of the most important uh, bits of data that was needed uh, for the WAD adoption and approval of FDG PET into clinical practice. It showed that we just needed a low sensitivity of 0.45 um, in order to have superiority in terms of cost effectiveness over CT alone and spe a PET specificity of, of nearly 0.1, super low um, to, to be cost effective. So this was really pioneering work. But as I mentioned before, you know, Metabolism is highly complex, and really with FDG, we're only looking at this part of the process. So it's no surprise that subsequently we've, uh, through the community, have developed a whole range of different uh, radio traces to try and assess various different components of cancer metabolism. Now, I won't go into the details um, here. 
But I wanted to sort of highlight one of the things that Sam and his lab um, spent time on, and that's trying to image this one um, really key enzyme in glycolytic flux, which is pyruvate, chem uh, pyruvate kinase M2. And the reason why pyruvate kinase M2 or PKM2 is important is because it can be regulated um, in terms of um, it, its expression quite readily, and it can switch from a, a tetrameric state, which has very high affinity for phosphorinyl pyruvate, um, and therefore you have high activity to, to produce pyruvate itself, um, and that, but also it can be regulated in terms of the production of its dimeric state, which actually has low affinity for phosphorinyl pyruvate, and so you have a reduction in the flux uh, to pyruvate through uh, uh, glycolysis. And one of the reasons why this is important is because it's thought that uh, you get sort of a buildup of these uh, glycolytic intermediates, which then can then be siphoned off for the biosynthesis of multiple macromolecules. So we're really interested in Sam's lab of trying to image this important uh, enzyme. Um, and we created a new uh, a new radio tracer that's based upon this high affinity binder to PKM2. So this is uh, we, it's called PKM223 here, but it's, uh, we, uh, we named it DARSA23, has very high affinity for PKM2. Um, and what we showed is that um, by knocking down PKM2 um, protein, we had a really great um, correlation between the amount of our radio tracer that was taken up into the cells which um, the, and the radio tracer was labeled with carbon 11 um, compared to the protein level itself. So we actually got really beautiful images um, in the brain of this um, this orthotopic uh, tumor model uh, injected into the brains of mice and this of course was done actually with with Michelle as well. Um, we co-first authored this, this paper um, and we got very nice um, contrast between the normal um, healthy countilateral uh, brain. So let me just show this. So this shows uh, in the MIP that we are really getting true signal in the tumour here um, in, in the brain itself. And again we did some experiments where we overlaid um, the uh, T2, T1 weighted MRI where you could nicely depict uh, the, the tumour with the PKM2 imaging agent that we developed um, and also this really beautifully corresponded with uh, histology so you can see the tumour in the brain here you can see that the, only the tumour and not the healthy brain actually expresses PKM2 and it doesn't express uh, the, the other isozyme PKM1 so we were quite excited um, about these findings and subsequent to this um, this work has been continued by uh, Corinne, who has developed a fluorin 18, a fluorin 18 version of the tracer, so switched from the 11 methyl to the fluorin 18 at this position, um, and she's taken this all the way into first in man studies. So this is just looking at healthy volunteers. You can see uh, combined renal and hepatobiliary excretion um, with PKM2 um, tracer. Um, you can see that this tracer area and rapidly washes out in uh, in healthy uh, healthy subjects, but really nicely. Um, what she showed in this recently published paper is in in these papers with high grade gliomas, um, which might be difficult to see on T two one T one weighted images. You can nicely depict the tumors by imaging them with uh, with um, DARSA twenty three. Okay, so uh, with the remaining time that I have, I just want to sort of go over some of the work that my lab is doing and introduce uh, some, some of the things that Hannah will be speaking about. We're really interested in trying to develop novel imaging methods to detect um, drug resistance cancer and its relation to, um, to cancer metabolism. And actually, cancer metabolism is uniquely linked to drug resistance in the fact that it fuels many of the antioxidants that uh, help these tumours resist therapy. So, for example, if we look at uh, glycolysis, as shown here, um, and also amino acid metabolism is depicted through XCT, these are all linked via the pentose phosphate pathway to effectively make very high levels of NADPH, one of the key antioxidants, and also the body's most abundant antioxidant, glutathione. 
So we're going to be talking a lot about this over the, the next uh, sort of 45 minutes or so. And both of these are linked via XCT. Uh, and XCT is a, um, is a trans uh, amino acid transporter that brings in one molecule of cysteine in exchange of one molecule of glutamate. Um, and the reason why this is so important is it provides the rate limiting precursors for de novo glutathione biosynthesis, which, as I mentioned, is the primary um, antioxidant inside the, uh, the body. And we can image this, the activity of this amino acid transporter with a fluorinating uh, labelled uh, glutamate analogue, which is 18FFSPD, which effectively just monitors the, the, uh, the uptake and the efflux of this um, uh, transporter. Uh, this uh, FSPG has actually already been used before, so you have exquisite contrast. Uh, in healthy volunteers, you only get uptake really in the uh, the pancreas, which expresses high levels of, uh, of XCT, and also in the soft palate. It's renally excreted, rapidly cleared from the blood, and this allows us to generate really beautiful high contrast images in these uh, various different tumour types, as shown here and here. Some of these were performed at Stanford. But we were really interested in molecular mechanisms, and Hannah's going to talk about this in, in more detail, um, that uh, XCT is uh, uniquely linked to the antioxidant production mechanisms. So what we saw is that when we oxidatively stressed cells, as shown on the x-axis here, so the further to the right, the more oxidatively stressed they are, we saw a, a nice uh, corresponding reduction in FSPG uptake. This was also shown in uh, tumour bearing mice. So this is the same animal. Uh, you see that the tumour lights up just beautifully. Just following one day of oxidatively stressed chemotherapy, we see a marked reduction in FSPG retention, which is maintained up to day six. Of course, we can quantify that. Um, and so we see a halving following oxidative stress. And actually this occurs prior to reduction in, um, in tumour size. And to cut a really long story short, we also use metabolomics and uh, heavy labeled cysteine tracing, cysteine tracing, sorry, I could say, to prove the mechanism behind this reduction. Effectively, what you get is you get an increase in, increase in de novo glutathione biosynthesis, which exchanges with FSPG, which is the reason why we get less signal in total as FSPG is effluxed out. So to summarize, we are really interested in trying to image multiple compartments of um, cancer metabolism and its unique link to the redox status inside these tumour cells. XCT is a really interesting amino acid transporter which we think might give us a bit of a handle on the levels of oxidative S inside these tumours and this is linked to glutathione uh, because it prov uh, XCT provides the rate limiting precursor for this so please remember that and we've used this previously to assess response to chemotherapy in uh, animal models of cancer. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I'm really excited to hear Hannah's presentation, but I want to finish by saying, you know, uh, Sam's lab was like a family. And one of the beautiful things is the fact that we all stick together still, and we still talk to each other on a regular basis and we support each other through multiple networks. So this is an example of uh, just my group and Christina Zavaletta's group, another ex-Gambia member, um, sharing a lab meeting together. And there's multiple other reasons why we still keep this going. Um, and I've made many lifelong friends. So with that, I probably always talk too long. So I'll stop there and thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Tim. And you're right, I, the, the people that um, we met through Sam, the people that you brought together, uh, is really one of the, the most wonderful gifts. And I think he, just the way he mentored us all and brought us all together. And um, it's so nice to see people continuing to, to be together and help each other. Uh, thank you for that great overview uh, of just helping us to all understand a bit more about why people are so interested in imaging cancer metabolism. It was great to hear about some of the highlights and things that Sam was really interested in investigating in that area and to hear about the work that you're continuing uh, in your lab. And uh, we're really excited to hear from Hannah, uh, who is the, the next uh, generation what, that Sam would call his grandchild. So you're Sam's grandchild. Hannah, uh, you're continuing the work as well and um, building it in your, in your own unique way, I'm sure. And we're, we're all really excited to hear about that. Uh, just a little bit about Hannah before she dives in. 
Uh, Dr. Hannah Greenwood completed her Bachelor of Science and uh, obtained honours as well in Anatomy and Human Biology at the University of Liverpool before completing a Master's in Biological Sciences. Hannah completed her PhD at the University of College London in Molecular Imaging under the supervision of Dr. Tim Whitney here, uh, and she investigated the use of PET uh, for the non-invasive imaging of, of drug resistance in cancer. In 2020, Hannah was awarded a Welcome EPSRC Centre for Medical Engineering Postdoctoral Fellowship at King's College London, where she continued her work on imaging drug resistance in Dr. Tim Whitney's lab. And now I hear that there's hot off the press data uh, that we, we should all be really excited to hear about. And so I have a little drum roll. <laughs> Hannah, turning Amazing. it over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay, so yeah, thank you so much, Michelle, for the that really warm introduction, and uh, thank you to WM, uh, WMIS um, for um, inviting us to talk today. I'm super excited to go through some of the um, work that um, I've spent probably the last two, maybe three years on. Um, so yeah, so I'll go straight into it. I'm just gonna leave that. Um, so yeah, the title of the, my presentation today is uh, Imaging the Master Regulator of the Tumor Antioxidant Response, uh, which is also called NERF2, um, in non-small cell lung cancer with PET imaging. Oh, oh, my slides aren't moving. There we go. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. So uh, what's the clinical need to image drug resistance in non-small cell lung cancer? Well, um, non-small or lung cancer, it's the leading cause of cancer deaths worldwide, um, accounting for over um, one and a half million people per year. Um, and unfortunately, the majority or a large proportion of patients are diagnosed at really late stage disease. Um, the current... Um, standard of care therapy for the majority of patients is uh, adjuvant uh, platinum therapy in combination with radiotherapy. However, the 10 year survival of these patients is super low, uh, um, you know, only about 5%. And something that we're really interested in is the fact that a third of non-small cell lung cancer patients contain either a mutation in um, NERF2 or, or KEEP1. And this has been shown now many times to reduce overall patient survival. So the aim of uh, the work that um, I've been involved in is to understand whether we can use FSPG PET as a surrogate marker of NRF2 status uh, for imaging drug resistance. Okay, but before I start, just a quick introduction to NERV2. Uh, so it's the master regulator of the antioxidant response, um, and it has a, a huge role in the detoxification of reactive oxygen species. Um, it's involved in me metabolic reprogramming, as Tim's just mentioned, um, increase in cell survival. And because of this, it has a, a key role and a, a huge link to resistance to chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Um, but in, in normal healthy cells, um, key, uh, NRF2 or NERF2, sorry, I'll try and stick to one, NERF2 is um, negatively regulated by its binding to keep one, which, which results in its degradation. Um, however, either in um, instances of uh, oxidative stress or where there's a mutation in either keep one or NERF2, we get this um, bind a uh, complex um, stabilization and that results in any new uh, or any de novo uh, NRF2 being translocated to the nucleus and turning on these antioxidant response element genes uh, that play this huge role in um, maintaining the redox status of cells. And one of those antioxidant response elements that is turned on is um, XCT. So Tim's just introduced you to XCT, uh, but quickly it, it allows the um, exchange, it's a transmembrane protein, it allows the exchange of glutamate uh, for cysteine that's rapidly reduced to cysteine and then um, is the rate limiting amino acid for uh, glutathione biosynthesis. 
and we're really interested in XET um, because it's the, this is the mechanism of which um, FSPG is retained within uh, cancer cells. Okay, so going on to the data. Um, so we began our uh, investigations by looking at a panel of non-small cell lung cancer lines, and we selected these based on their KEEP1 mutational status. So we have four cell lines here, um, which have either wild type KEEP1 or a, a silent mutation in the case of H23, and then four cell lines that have mutations in uh, KEEP1 resulting in higher NRF2 expression. And this increased NRF2 expression corresponds to an increase in XET. Um, so um, the first thing we wanted to look at is um, uh, cysteine consumption within the within these eight cell lines. And we saw that um, in the KEEP1 mutant lines, we have a much higher cysteine consumption. So um, over a period of four hours. So uh, a lot more cysteine is being taken out of the media and being brought into the cells uh, with this KEEP1 mutation high NRF2. Um, and uh, this corresponded to large increases in extracellular, uh, sorry, intracellular glutathione within these cells. So the cysteine is being brought into the cells and uh, used for um, GSH biosynthesis. Um, and then going downstream from that, we then looked at the intracellular ROS in these cells, um, so how oxidatively stressed they were, and the baseline ROS was uh, much lower in the uh, mutant lines versus those um, NRF2 low keep one wild type um, cells. But what about FSPG retention? So we incubated uh, the cells for an hour um, in the presence of FSPG. And in the four um, NRF2 low cell lines, we, we saw a reasonable, reasonably low level of uptake, uh, averaging about 5%. Um, but then when we compared that to the FSPG retention in the NRF2 high cell lines, um, we, have, we, had, we, we saw over a doubling of uh, retention. Um, if we then correlate that to the amount of glutathione present in those cells, we saw a wonderful correlation between FSPG retention and uh, intracellular glutathione. So um, next, we wanted to further validate what we saw um, in the baseline FSPG retention in these cells. Um, and we did this uh, by genetically manipulating um, NRF2 um, in a selection of cell lines in collaboration with uh, Gina de Nicola's lab over at the Moffitt Cancer Centre. So the first uh, cell line that we looked at was the A549 cells that have this um, have very high NRF2 expression in their wild type state. Um, and then when we knocked out NRF2, we subsequently saw um, a decrease in, in XCT expression. When we then looked at FSPG retention in these cells, we saw about an 80% reduction um, in FSPG um, when incubated for an hour. Um, and then when we restored uh, NRF2 back into the knockout lines, um, FSPG retention was rescued and returned close to uh, what we saw of the baseline cells. So we then went on to take it and, and took one of the NRF2 low cell lines, uh, the H1299, and inserted a, a, muta a, a mutated version of NRF2 that led to increases in NRF2 expression and, uh, albeit slight, but increases in XCT as well. And again, when we looked at uh, FSPG retention, we saw increases um, in, in FSPG. So the, the final um, bit of work we did in vitro was uh, moving on to pharmacologically manipulate the level of NRF2 in our cell lines with a small molecule um, called CHI-696. Uh, so CHI-696 um, prevents uh, KEEP1 NRF2 binding and results in an increase in NRF2 expression. So what we've got here is the four um, NRF2 low uh, cell lines. And you can see that when we've treated them with CHI-696 for 24 hours, we get an increase in both um, NRF2 and XCT um, in uh, all four uh, cell lines. 
So then when we looked at FSPG, um, again, matching what we'd seen um, in both the baseline levels of FSPG retention and um, in the knockout models, when we increased NRF2 expression, we also saw an increase in FSPG retention. And this increase in FSPG retention corresponded to an increase in cysteine consumption. So more cysteine was being used by these cells um, following NRF2 um, expression increase. Um, and then that led to an increase in uh, intracellular glutathione levels. Okay, so moving on to the in vivo side um, of the work that we've been doing. Uh, so as a group, we've really tried um, to move to using more clinically relevant models. Um, and the first of this um, has been using an orthotopic model of non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so uh, here's just an image of the setup that we have um, in the lab, uh, where we can illuminate uh, from externally the back of the throat of the mouse, visualize the vocal cords and the entry to the trachea, and directly insert cells non-invasively. Um, so without doing any surgeries, we can insert those cells into the lungs of mice. Um, and the cells that we've uh, implanted in the mice are luciferase positive, allowing us to monitor tumor development over time with bioluminescence imaging. And here's just an example of one mouse uh, that we followed over a, a three week period. Um, as well as monitoring um, tumor growth with bioluminescence imaging, uh, we also performed some CT imaging, and um, so this is just an axial plane. Uh, you can see the heart uh, is here, and then over time, the light gray, I guess, blobs <laughs> go bigger, and you can just see in this final three-week frame that there's a large tumor now uh, present in the, the lung of this mouse. And so when we imaged these mice with FSPG PET, um, so that, sorry, the, the first cell line that we've used here is this H, H1299 cell line. And if you remember back to my previous slides, this is one of the um, NRF2 wild, uh, NRF2 low, so keep one wild type cell lines. And just arrow uh, with, with the dotted line, um, here is just the outline of a tumor in the um, in the lung of this mouse. Um, I should probably just go through this image actually. So this is a maximum intensity projection of a very typical FSPG scan. Uh, so we have clearance uh, renally. So you, you can see uh, clearance through the kidneys and into the bladder. This uh, area here is the pancreas. And then we also have the soft palate. Anyway, sorry, that was a bit of a side note. Um, so with the H1299s, we get relatively low uh, FSPG retention. So it averaged at about 3%. When we then uh, compared that to a mouse bearing a H460 orthotopic mouse or multiple mice bearing H460 um, tumors, we got, uh, we saw, you know, threefold increase in tumor retention. Um, and just these movies here, uh, hopefully show quite nice so that the, the tumors present uh, in the, you can see the tumor in the, in the thorax, the thorax here in the lungs of these mice. Uh, so following imaging, the mice were called um, and we performed some ex vivo Western blots and just to look at the levels of both nerve two and XCT. And again, this matched really nicely what we um, had seen in our um, in vitro models. Okay, so moving on to the, the next model, and again, this was a huge collaboration with uh, Gina De Nicola's lab over at the Moffitt Cancer Center, um, and for this we used um, two genetically engineered mouse models, one of which has um, wild type, uh, so uh, following tumor formation um, after the um, administration of uh, uh, a Cre virus, uh, the tumors that were formed have um, our NRF2 wild type. And then she also, we also used a model that has produces tumors with um, NRF2 um, mutant, which are NRF2 mutant. So the wild type um, NRF2 mice are, uh, or the control mice that we used that were the KP model, um, which I'm sure many people in the audience have heard of. So these mice produce tumors, which are P53 null and have mutations in um, KRAS, but they were NRF2 wild type. 
and following quantification um, of these um, uh, of the tumors from the imaging that we performed, we saw about a 10, 11% injected dose, which is you know relatively high uh, for an FSPG retention. Uh, when we then imaged the NKP mice or these mice that have the mutation uh, pr that have tumors with the nerf 2 mutation as well as the p53 null and KRAS mutations, uh, we saw huge um, levels of FSPG retention within those individual tumor lesions um, and averaging at uh, over 30% injected dose per gram, which is the highest amount of FSPG we've ever seen in a, in, in a tumor. So this was super exciting data for us. Okay, so then uh, moving on to the last bit of um, the, the last in vivo model that we've been working on. Um, this has been imaging um, patient tissue um, with FSPG in collaboration with TracerX. So uh, tra TracerX, um, it's a huge collaborative study and they aim to understand both uh, intertumoral and inter uh, intra and intertumoral heterogeneity um, of lung cancer patients. Uh, and they monitor these patients over many years uh, with the aim to understand um, heterogeneity and the risk of reoccurrence um, of disease in these patients. Uh, and what I've got on the screen here is just some transcriptomic data um, that they've performed on um, around 50 patients looking at uh, XCT. And you can see the huge um, heterogeneity um, both between patients um, on the x-axis here and also within different patients um, as, as well. And so we were super lucky to get our hands on two um, PDXs from them or two lots of patient tissue, which we grew as subcutaneous tumors. So the first was an NRF2 wild type uh, tumor where we saw relatively um, low FSPG retention. Um, and then the second tumor um, that we got was NR uh, had mutation, a mutation in NRF2, and this led to an increase in FSPG retention. Um, so when we quantified these images, again, we saw um, over a doubling of FSPG retention in the, um, in the NRF2 mutant tumors versus the NRF2 wild type. Um, but what's also really interesting uh, and something that we're going to uh, continue to work on is looking at actually the uh, heterogeneity that you see um, in these tumors, which often, you know, which often you don't see when you use uh, a xenograft model taken uh, that, that's, that's grown from just a, 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 a human cell line. Um, and that heterogeneity in both um, NERV2 and XET is also shown uh, ex, uh, through some ex vivo Western blots that, that we performed after um, culling these mice. Okay, so um, to conclude, sorry, I feel like I've gone far too fast through all of that. Um, I really hope I've managed to convince at least some of you that um, FSVG can be used, at least in the models that we've looked at in non-small cell lung cancer as a surrogate marker of NRF2 expression uh, in vitro. Um, and the FSPG retention really correlates very nicely to the redox potential of the, the cells that we've looked at. Um, also, you know, uh, we've shown now in multiple models that FSPG can distinguish between NRF2 high and NRF2 low tumors. Um, uh, yeah, in, in multiple models of, of non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, but just before I finish, um, like what's next? Um, you know, this has been uh, this has been a huge body of work that we've tried to show that FSPG can be used to determine the NRF2 status of these cells. But why, why do we care? What, why have we done this? Um, well, the next, the, the aim is to then, um, you know, use this imaging data to um, uh, provide either an alternative therapy to patients or in our case at the moment, mice, <laughs> with uh, an alternative therapy rather than standard of care that can improve uh, or cause tumor reduction uh, or cause a uh, tumor reduction the tumors to reduce in size um, and we really want to use um, imaging to um, 
you know um like helping the understanding and and help um provide the alternative therapies um that might not be offered as a standard of care for those patients that do have nrf2 high tumors and uh you know guide using fspg as a guide as a guidance for this um okay so i'd just like to finish by um thank you firstly thanking tim um my supervisor who's uh, been a rock throughout all of this work um, but as well the multiple members of both Tim's group and uh, people here at King's that have um, made this work possible um, uh, as well as our collaborators at UCL and at the Moffitt Cancer Centre uh, and finally the funding bodies that have allowed this work to to be possible um, so yeah thank you <laughs> Thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, thanks for sharing your latest data. Uh, very impressive. There's um, some questions in the chat that I'll they'll read out now, and then I'm sure uh, a few of us here have some questions too, Jason and I, but let's have a look at what folk are asking. So the first question is um, from Edwin Chang, and it says, is there any evidence that alterations in metabolism of tumors can alter the metabolism of the surrounding tissue in turn? If true, uh, what are the consequences to molecular imaging of cancer metabolism? This is a general question to both Dr. Whitney and Dr. Greenwood. Can I go? Is sure. that all right? No, there's some really amazing um, data that's come out over the last you know, five, 10 years um, that has shown that actually you can get shuttling of metabolites between tumor tissues and the surrounding um, tumor microenvironment, so the stroma, for example. So there is uh, quite a lot of data um, that's out there that, for example, lactate can then, that is uh, excreted by these tumor cells can be used as a substrate and taken up by the M MCTs and used by surrounding tissues as a fuel for proliferative growth. Um, and, and this is really fascinating. Um, of course, like with PET, all we see is signal. So, you know, we can't really convolute um, where that signal is coming from, whether it be coming from the tumor cells themselves or the surrounding environment. But I guess ultimately, you know, as long as we're seeing robust changes that relate to phenotype um, and that we can actually, and uh, we have something that's actually actionable on that phenotype. Uh, and I really think nerve two, for example, is something that is actionable um, and we can improve outcomes in, in nerve two mutant patients. Um, you know, that, that probably is all that matters. Now, what we're doing over at King's, we've got this wonderful setup where we've got um, we've got a fax machine that we can we can use. So we can effectively do an FSPG uptake in vivo. We can take out the tumors, we can homogenize, um, and then we can sort the various different cell populations, you know, depending on the stains that, that, that we have. Um, and um, that allows us to then, if we sort those different populations, we can then go and count them in the gamma counter and we can really understand um, the proportion that contributes to, to, to the signal that we see as this sort of bulk average on, on, the, PET, on the PET scanner. And, you know, look, we're, we're not the ones that like, started to pioneer this. I mean, UCLA have been doing this technique for a long time and was part of the inspiration for, for us to do this. But I think it's such a powerful method for us to start understanding the contribution, the, uh, the contribution of metabolism through the various different components of the microenvironment. And you, you just can't do that using other methods and you certainly can't do that in vivo. Uh, but Hannah, I was just going to say, I don't know, maybe you want to stop sharing your screen because although this is really beautiful, yeah. probably people would much rather see your face. Which is way more. See, I'm, I'm <laughs> bossing it around already, even in a webinar. Sorry. <laughs> Hannah, did you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I think Tim summarised that really well um, and the struggles that we currently have and then hopefully, you know, the experiments that, that we can do to try and solve those problems and answer those questions. That's great. And we do have a question for you, another one. Uh, fascinating results. Is FSPG transferred bidirectionally? Uh, what is the optimum time for imaging? Yeah, so it is. Um, and um, I have some data, I've not shown it today, uh, that we've also 
you, you know, so FSPG is brought into the cell in exchange for glutamate being effluxed, but then it's also effluxed in exchange for cystine being brought in. Uh, so it's quite a complicated tracer. Um, sorry, I've forgotten what the second part of that question was, Michelle. It was what the optimum imaging. Oh, and the opti So we image the imaging data that I've shown today um, is the summed 40 to 60 minute um, uh, data. Um, FSPG peaks in all of the tumors that we've looked at at around 30, 40 minutes and plateaus and stays there for, you know, an hour or so uh, before being washed out as, um, you know, that we have super fat blood clearance. Um, yeah. Great. Excellent. Uh, another question. This one from Christopher Hensley. It says, any idea if uh, NERF2 mutants demonstrate higher intracellular glutamate levels at baseline versus wild type in the lung cancer model? By the way, great talks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, we've also looked um, at glutamate um, and we see increases in intracellular glutamate in those um, mutant lines versus the wild type. Um, yeah. Excellent. It's quite interesting, though, that data. And the reason why that data is sort of quite interesting for me is because really you see massive upregulation of the transporter and you see a huge increase in the activity of that transporter as shown through FSPG. But you would also expect to see increases in efflux of glutamate as more cystine is coming in. So clearly, NERF2 has uh, quite a profound role on cellular metabolism because you're also get, getting um, you know, either de novo. Uh, glutamate synthesis or, or some increased um, uptake, maybe via glutamine, for example. So I think there's profound metabolic changes occurring in, in those, um, those mutant tumours. Great. Uh, one more question from Edwin. Uh, he says, maybe a bit random, but is there any relationship between modulating nerf 2 expression, ROS levels, and alterations in EGFR expression and or activity? I was struck uh, that you studied NSCLC lines, which have different resistance to tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And um, we've not looked at that. Um, that would really be very interesting. Um, but no, it's not something that as a group we've been looking at. Uh, we've just been focusing primarily on um, NERF2 and KEEP1 uh, versus, um, versus that. Okay. Uh, I have a quick question. I, I thought your approach, everything is very systematic and well done, like thorough, just excellent work. Uh, I noticed some of your, your imaging data had this just incredible percent ID program, uh, uptake of the tracer up to, you said, around 30%, and some others were around 15%, and you were showing beautiful Western blots to correlate with the sort of levels of protein expression. Did you sort of look at the ones that were around the 30% ID program and what was, I guess, was the percent ID really um, correlating with the protein expression um, when you compare between the different models or was that not something you looked at yet? Um, so I've not, that would be something really interesting to do actually, Michelle. Um, I've not compared um, XCT protein in the GEMS versus just the orthotopic tumors. Um, but yeah, that would be super interesting to see if the levels of XETs are, are, are way higher uh, in the gems where we saw that, you know, average at 30% injected dose um, in the NRF2 uh, mutant uh, tumors. Uh, but no, we, we haven't looked at that. Um, the hypothesis behind the high retention in those NRF2 mutant uh, gems uh, gem tumors is um, the the utilization of cysteine resulting in FSPG not being effluxed, um, but that's something that we really need to look at in more detail. Um, but maybe starting by just doing a simple Western blot of the of the lysates on the same gel would be would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's well, some really there's some really interesting just coming out of Gina's lab in Moffat. Um, where, because of course she she creates this, this beautiful model, um, and she's actually one of the the world experts on on NERF two biology, um, and uh, a preprint that's just come out recently from her lab is actually using these same um, tumor models. Uh, 
hopefully I'll do her justice here, but she's shown that like there's a there's really a threshold as well of, of where the elevated nerve two is beneficial. And over that threshold, potentially it could be detrimental for tumor progression. So what we really want to try and understand as well with the with the nerve two mutant and the nerve two high um, uh, tumors, the FSPG, you know, lighting up like a Christmas tree. In, in certain lesions, they're very, very high, but in others, it's not so high. Well, how does that relate to the progression of these tumors within that model itself? Um, so so c can we can we find out some extra information? And, and really, I'm fascinated by the heterogeneity question, like why is the heterogeneity, given the fact that it's a relatively sort of simple uh, model and the fact that three, three genes are mutated and, and that's it. Of course, they acquire other mutations as, as the cancer progresses, but um, there's still a lot, I think, for us to try and understand using these beautiful models that other people have created and we're lucky enough to use. Yeah, it's great to have collaborators that are experts in these areas that us imaging folk can work closely with and learn from and we can help each other. I think it's beautiful to see those collaborations. Uh, I was also going to ask about the flow, but I think you, you kind of answered my question there. And someone else had a little question that I, th I think my understanding is you haven't done the flow yet. That's the plan, right? You're planning to do flow. Yeah. No? Hasn't, has, hasn't been done. I mean, we're only just trying to get this um, up and running in, inside our lab. And of course, there are some of these models uh, which we have to grow them up in immunodeficient mice. So with the orthotopic you know, this has to be, these are human um, non-small cell lung cancer lines, so it has to be immunodeficient, the same with the PDX, but with the GEM, you can start to understand what the contribution of that signal is, like whether it be stroma, whether it be uh, tumour, whether it be, you know, immune infiltration, for example, and, and certainly activated immune cells upregulate XCT. So, you know, this is also a really interesting area and, and there's something that we're actively investigating. Great. Yes. So for when you do do your fax experiment, um, uh, Dr. Boulet said, uh, you mentioned the fax machine, uh, perhaps you're going to be able to see the Shrenkov radiation coming off these cells. So that's something that was mentioned in the chat. And uh, I'm not, so, I'm not so sure. I mean, I, I think like the levels of uh, activity that we have in there, like are probably our trace, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's not going to be that sensitive, but be interesting. Maybe we should just have a look at UV um, on the on the channel um, and, and see what we see. Yeah. Okay. Jason, did you have a question? Um, I do, but I also see that there's actually some questions in the Q&A um, tab as well. There's actually three questions. Um, okay. Would you like to, uh, Andreas okay. has some questions, so feel free, Michelle. Okay, yeah, excellent talk, Hannah, from Andreas. And uh, they said, do you have any idea how the post-translational modifications of NERF2 influence imaging? For example, gly glycolation seems to influence activity. Um, that's not something that we've looked at. Um, you know, the, the mutations that, uh, or uh, we've really looked at keep uh, mutations in keep one. Uh, that then result in the overexpression of, of nerve two and then the downstream, you know, in, increases in expression of XCT. Um, but that would be something as well interesting to, to look at. I don't know, Tim, what you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, nerve two is is uh, regulated by so many different things. I mean, it's, it, it, it's primarily driven by uh, sorry, XCT, sorry, it's expression and activity is driven by so many different things. Um, nerve 2 being one of the primary mediators of that activity, but certainly post-translational modification um, will have a, a big influence on this. Um, at the moment, we just want to try and get ha a handle on some of the basics first, and then I think it, we go to the next step to see the sensitivity of our imaging tests to to assess those. But um, I think at least hopefully now we've proved or shown to you guys and convinced you that uh, mutations in nerve two or keep one um, really alter um, or profoundly alter FSPG retention. We could use it as a decent surrogate marker. 
Excellent. Uh, Peter Gorn says, great talks and interesting data from both Dr. Whitney and Dr. Greenwood. As always, uh, exclamation point, a slightly off topic, maybe. I was wondering why you always see high pancreatic uptake of FSPG in your in vivo images. Any idea what biological processes are involved in that uptake? And um, so uh, there's we know that there's high levels of XCT um, present in the pancreas of, of tissues in both the human and mice. Um, I think I'm, I'm not hugely sure why um, there is. I, it's most likely uh, a, a result in a high redox environment in the pancreas. Um, I think there's some studies looking at uh, insulin uh, production as well and its involvement in that. Um, but sorry, Pete. <laughs> You're going to have to Google it. <laughs> okay, two more questions. Uh, Stephanie Slenia says, great presentations today. I was wondering if any blocking studies were done to this with this tracer. And we've done that previously. Um, and we uh, that's been shown previously, uh, previously by others as well, that um, FSPG is very specific to um, XCT. Um, we show that we, we uh, published last year um, and then that's been shown many times um, using multiple blocking studies, uh, both in vivo, uh, 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 mostly in vitro. Um, it's actually quite difficult to block FSPG retention in, vi in vivo, um, but there are um, small molecules such as IKE that can be used, um, but the PK of that actually in vivo is pretty poor still. Um, but we, we, yeah, again, we showed that last year. Yeah, a read our Theranostics paper. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it was published this year, Hannah. Oh, it this seems year. like oh, it was gosh. such a long time ago. 2022. It was definitely paper. submitted last year. <laughs> Thanks for explaining that so clearly for everyone on online. I think that was a great description, Hannah. Uh, another question in the live chat is from Dr. Chen. Have you compared the F18 FSPG images with FDG? Just wonder the high radioactive areas are the same or different? Um, no, we haven't. Um, it's always something at the back of our mind, I think, as cancer imaging biologists, like should we be comparing this to the gold standard, which is FDG? Um, I think um, maybe further down the line, I, I briefly mentioned like the next stage which is looking at you know monitoring therapy with FSPG I think most likely we'll do some comparative comparative studies with FDG and show um you know look at tumor visualization uh, rather than looking at uh, you know here we're looking at NRF we're trying to look at a, a nrf2 we're not interested really if there's a tumor there or not uh, realistically in the clinic that will be done you know before an fspg scan um but yeah i th i think most likely it, we probably will have to do some fdg comparisons <laughs> although i would say uh you know there's many fdg clinical scans out there for non-small cell lung cancer patients and there's absolutely no correlation whatsoever with status uh, certainly nerf 2 there so why do it where in the clinic it's proven not to be efficacious yeah that's true and i know we only have two minutes to go and I, we will ask jason a question in a second but before everyone drops offline i did want to say if you want to continue the chat and discussion and actually hear about the uh sort of viewpoints uh from hannah and and tim about about their thoughts on mentorship and science and life uh we'll be continuing this it's in the social lounge so on the left hand your side of the screen you can see social lounge so you can just click on that and even just join listen in have a cup of coffee with us uh, chat for a little bit there'll be more stories uh, but yes Jason please tell us if you have a question because we'd love to hear actually I want to go back to that mentorship question since we have one minute uh, for those that won't be able to join us in the social lounge perhaps uh, Hannah and Tim can quickly comment on that part before we jump to there yeah I guess we were saying before that both, uh, so Tim, I know you've experienced mentorship in North America as well as the UK and done your science and, and had some lovely mentors um, in both places. 
just curious if you can tell us a little bit more about that and maybe some differences, things we can learn from each other and Hannah as well, just hear about your experiences so far with mentorship. Yeah, I'll be as brief as I can. Um, but the, the, there's a profound differences in terms of the way that mentorship is approached both in North America and in Europe, or at least in the UK. In North America, it's um, an obligation almost, or it's certainly woven into the fabric of academia. Um, it's not seen as a sort of uh, a, a bum word or anything like that. Like it, it's there that it's part of somebody's job to mentor others. And I guess mentorship comes in many different guises. I think probably, uh, although I've been very lucky to experience a wonderful mentorship throughout my career in the UK, it's probably less sort of talked about um, and it's done a bit more on an informal basis, but it's still as important in the UK as it is in the US. It's just, it's more openly discussed and people are trained to become good mentors in, in the US. I should say the Royal Society do an amazing mentorship program in the UK, which I'm fortunate enough to be a mentor on. Um, and they're the people who are really pushing the way for mentorship. Yeah, um, and I guess from my perspective, like I feel super fortunate that I've had Tim as both a supervisor and a mentor <laughs> for the past, um, you know, six, nearly seven years. Um, the opportunities for mentorship are available here in the UK. Um, I, as Tim mentioned, I don't think it's um, as much um, as openly done. Um, as it is over in America um but you know there's great opportunities to um get get a mentor through you know societies like with the uh, WMIC WMIS um EMIM have a great mentorship scheme um yeah Great. Well, uh, we want to thank you both again for uh, these really two phenomenal talks, uh, very clear, uh, engaging and uh, exciting science. So thank you so much for your time. And we're looking forward to continuing the chat for those of you who can join and otherwise wishing everyone a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. <laughs>